we are going to be coming out of Philippians 3. So we've been in this series of uh, living out his story, his story being Jesus' story. And I've been given the task of discussing living out righteousness. The apostle said, all right. If you're on Facebook and you like it, go ahead and hit the like button. <laughs> but we're going to talk about living out righteousness today. Um, and if you guys know me, I like to, to move around. I like to be energetic. I like to uh, provoke some good conversation. So um, I want to start out, though, with a baseline of the definition of righteousness. Now, I looked this up as I was, I was studying, and, and there is a Greek word called dikaiosine. And you're probably like, how do you know how to pronounce that? YouTube is awesome. Okay, because I read it and I was like, um. but dikaio sine, and here's what it means, righteousness, what is right, justice, the act of what is in agreement with God's standards, but here's the one that I want to focus on, the state of being in proper relationship with God, the state of being in proper relationship with God. So when we talk about Living out righteousness, understand the baseline is the state of being in proper relationship with God. Are y'all ready to go? Amen. If you're ready to go, let me hear you. Amen. All right, let's go. Let's go. So, now, when you talk about righteousness, how many of y'all are on social media? Most of you guys are on social media. Anybody familiar with the, the red flag challenge that's going on right now? So for those of you that aren't, the red flag challenge is you put a statement up that, and then red flags after, because this statement stands for whenever you hear a statement like this, you need to be cautious of who you're dealing with, because they're probably lying, they're probably crazy, they, like there's something about this statement that makes you say, eh, pump the brakes, all right? So we're talking about living out righteousness, right? We're going to do the red flag test for uh, living out righteousness. So if we're talking about righteousness, and the first comment is, well, I was raised in church. Eh, hold up. Hey, if it's, I sing in the choir, I'm an usher, I'm a deacon. If, if, if anything comes to your position, when we talk about righteousness, eh, um, I come from a good Christian family. So did a lot of people. Eh. I've never done drugs. I haven't stolen anything. I don't. Eh. I've read the whole Bible before. Well, if you would live two pages, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. <laughs> Red flag. This is my favorite one right here. We talk about righteousness. God knows my heart. He does. <laughs> so there are these red flags. Now, we're going to dive into Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 3, and I'm going to kind of be jumping around a little bit in this, but you'll get it. But I want to bring this from the perspective of Paul was writing about this righteous life, and it's what does it take? to live out this righteous life. What does it take to get to that state of being in proper relationship with God? We're going to start with Romans 3, and we're going to read 3 through 6 first. I, I said Philippians. That's what I meant. Yep, Philippians. <laughs> Romans. Yeah, we're doing a study on Philippians. I want you to turn to Romans, okay? <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> All right, so Philippians 3. Through six says, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. 
Paul laid out here that if anybody can deem themselves righteousness by their stature, their, their position, their pedigree, it was him. And he put no confidence in that. Why? Because even with all of that, we're talking about the state of being in proper relationship with God, right? You can have position, stature, a title, a bloodline, and not be in proper relationship with the Father. You can have all of the credentials that men would say qualify you and not be in proper relationship with the Father. And so Paul said, I don't put any trust in that. Now, this was a time where, um, as you guys know in the law, the first five books of the Bible, they, there were really strict rules about what following God looked like, what, what being one of the chosen people, an Israelite, a Hebrew, circumcision, and a bunch of other laws that you had to follow. And Paul was like, I'm, I'm faultless. I, I have followed these laws, right? But he comes here to say, um, circumcision doesn't make you circumcised. Right. What? Verse 3, circumcision doesn't make you circumcised. So now we can go to Romans 2, 28 and 29, and I'm just going to read it for the sake of time, but you can write it down if you're taking notes. Romans 2, verses 28 and 29 says, A person is not a Jew who is only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. And I'm going to tell you, we'll, we'll find out why this is important. But Paul started talking about this. There's this posturing of the heart to God that God is concerned about. It's not all this other stuff. So when he said, I have no confidence in my flesh, I have no confidence in my, in my pedigree. He realized none of these external things matter when it comes to walking out righteousness with Christ. Amen. None of them matter. What Paul realized was that he was blinded by his pedigree. See, Paul was persecuting the church, which is in opposition to what God stands for. Think about it. God tells us to be witnesses. He tells us to draw men unto him. At what point does he tell us to go persecute sinners so that they get saved? Where? Where? See, Paul was zealous. He was ambitious. He had knowledge of the law. He could quote the law front, back, side to side. He was living out the law, but he wasn't living out the heart of Christ. He wasn't living out the purpose that Christ had him, created him for, that Christ was calling him for. So there is a blinding. When we start to allow our pedigree, what we know, what we don't know, the fact that we've grown up in church, the fact that we come from a good Christian family, oh, I went to a Christian school, I went to a Catholic school. Come on. When we start to look at what other people aren't to elevate ourselves to think we're not that bad. Woo. See, that's confidence in the flesh. So yeah, you, you don't have Paul's credentials, but we still do that in and of ourselves. Compare ourselves to that person. Uh, well, I'm good then. I'm good with God. if Because <laughs> I know. I ain't saying no names, but. 
And we use that to justify our position in Christ. But when we're talking about living out righteousness, see, none of that matters because righteousness is the state of being in proper relationship with God. And my state of being in proper relationship with God has zero to do with how somebody else is living their life, how I compare or measure up to somebody else. And so when we start to over-index on the outward, we get blinded and can't see the truth. And so we start to feel like we're okay. Because I guarantee you when Paul was doing what he was doing, he felt justified. He felt like, I'm right. I'm protecting the law. See, Paul was focused on the letter of the law and not the author of the law. Get that. He was focused on the letter of the law and not the author. Thank you. Thank you, because I sure forgot mine. Uh, it's good to have pastor that sweats, boy, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It's good to know the big boy problems. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but Paul was focused on the letter of the law and not the author of the law. And, and, and we do that sometimes. Even some of us that have been Christians for a long time dealing with unsaved folks. We focus on the letter of the law. Even some of us as parents dealing with our kids, we focus on the letter of the law and not the author of the law. I want to see that outward behavior, but what about their spirit? Because outward behavior only takes you so far. Uh, the outward appearance flesh will have you care more about what others think than what God thinks. Right? We, we say these things, I was raised in church, I'm from a good Christian family, those are all to get people to buy in and see you a certain way. That, that's, what, that's why we say those things. It's like a resume to try to say, here's why you should think or feel this way about me. It'll also have you thinking that God is all good with where you are. And that's probably the most dangerous one. See, our, our self-confidence will have us thinking, we're good. Me and God are good. Me and God got an understanding. <laughs> I guarantee you Paul felt like he was good. He was good. He was doing the work, the hard work that others weren't willing to do to protect the law. And in all that hard work, in all of that, him feeling justified, he wasn't doing God's work. He thought he was. That's what happens to us sometimes. We justify where we're at. And in those justifications, we start to feel like, oh, God, we're all good. And God's like, no, I have more for you. I have a deeper place for us to connect. So that first thing was no confidence in the flesh, right? Paul realized, okay, if I'm going to live out this righteous thing, no confidence in the flesh. Um, Matthew, let's go to Matthew. And I'm, I'm, I, I have Matthew 17, 15 through 23, but I want to read this. Just 21 through 23 is what I'm going to read, but I want you guys to read it all, okay? It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name? God, we perform miracles in your name. And then I will plainly tell them, and if Jesus was saying this today, the Bible would probably read, real recognizes real. Depart from me, I never knew you. What? Y'all know that saying, real recognizes real. 
that's about the fruit, right? You can see when somebody joshes you, you're like, um, I didn't live that life. So what you're saying, I don't see because I don't see this, 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 and this. And Jesus was like, mm mm. But so here we go, putting confidence in our flesh, thinking that we all good with God, doing it our way, not being in proper relationship with Him, but working in His name. And then when we get up there thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, God. And, and here's proof, because they were like, wait, hold up. Lord, didn't we? I thought we, you know my heart, Lord. We, um, and God was like, nah, I don't know you. Because I don't know your heart. I never had your heart. I may have had your actions, but I didn't have your heart. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. The second point I want to make is this. Godly righteousness was about experiencing Christ not just knowing him. It was about Paul experiencing Christ, not just knowing laws, rules, having knowledge. Because we said righteousness is the state of being what? The state of being what? Okay, I want to make sure you get that as we talk. I'm going to keep hitting it, hitting it, hitting So, Because during the week when you're thinking, I'm walking out righteousness, it's the state of being in proper relationship with God. Amen. So Paul knew that righteousness was about experiencing God, not just knowing him. We must lay aside the things that stop us from experiencing Christ. I, I finished my sermon, notes, had gone over it a number of times, and I got in the bed last night and was laying there, and a word popped into me as I just, I couldn't go to sleep. And my wife was like, what are you thinking about? <laughs> And it's, man, it was almost midnight. What are you thinking about? And the word rubbish just kept hitting me. When Paul said, I consider them rubbish. He said he lost all things. I consider them rubbish. And the word for rubbish that hit me was Paul had to devalue those things that once had the most value in order to be able to find Christ, to walk into that righteousness. So young people over there that are laughing and talking, this is relative to you too. Because right now life is easy with mom and dad paying all your bills giving you up, making decisions for you, letting you do this, that, and the other. But there comes a time where you actually have to step out and start to live and walk on what has been implanted in you. And whether or not you're walking in this relationship with God properly or just trying to exercise and function off the knowledge that you got from sitting in this seat is going to determine how successful you are in navigating those issues. 
And so you can allow yourself to have a world of hell or of hope. We find ourselves engaged in things and walking through things and experiencing things that we didn't need to. Not because it was God's plan, but because we decided this is what we wanted to do. Because we all have a purpose, but not all of us will walk out that purpose. Not all of us will fulfill that purpose. And I'm jumping ahead of myself right now, but I want you to understand there are things we value in our lives right now that have to be devalued in order to really get in relationship and connection with Christ. It doesn't even always mean that they're bad things. It doesn't mean that. But it means sometimes that they're more important than the main thing. And so there has to be a shift. See, the things that Paul laid out were all things that he felt secured him in his position and authority. Which as a Pharisee, as a Hebrew, like, you know, he was, he was up there. So there was something to say about that. What are the things in your life right now that you value over being in proper relationship with Christ? That you value over knowing Christ? See, we want to know God up until the point it costs us those things that we really value. And so we disproportionately give our energy and time and resources to those things. It's anything you want. Education, sports, career, relationships, arts, just plain old having fun. Kicking it with my homies. There's a value. And so Paul said, I, I had to devalue those things. I had to consider those things rubbish to get right so that I could be in proper relationship with God so that the things that I lived out were based on that relationship. Right. Pastor Corey told you guys a, a story a few weeks ago when he was preaching. And... <clears throat> I love this story because it also goes back to uh, how we often try to persecute point fingers and, and push people to do things rather than teaching them about being in right relationship with God and allowing God's spirit to convict and move through the maturation process of growth to get them where they need to be. So Pastor Corey's telling you he used to love to go to the club and kick it and, and shake his rump and would be up in here and would still play and lead worship and love Jesus. And I remember when Pastor Corey would shut down on the weekends just to study his Bible. We'd be like, hey, Pastor Corey, we gonna do this? He's like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read my word. And, and he was going through this growth place of seeing what God wanted him to do, like who God really was and, and who he needed to be connected with God. He was going through this thing to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm buying in. God, I need to know how real this thing is because I've given up some things. I've devalued some things for this. And he said, he, he went to the club and just was like, man, I don't even belong here. It wasn't Pastor Harry, Apostle Harry, Apostle Deborah, or somebody else telling him, it wasn't nobody in the club like, Pastor Corey in the club. It was God saying, this ain't you no more. And it's not you anymore because you started valuing something else. That's 
why it's not you. It's not not you because you don't like to dance anymore. You don't like to kick it. That's not why it's not you. I made you a dancer. But it's not you because the value that you've placed on me in you has allowed me to transform your heart to show you that's not going to get you where I'm taking you. Where is God taking y'all? Young people, where is God taking you? Do you know the answer? Do you know where he's taking you? You have ideas of where you want to go, but do you know where he is taking you? Because I guarantee you, there are people in this building who had ideas of where they wanted to go, and they're not there. But where is God taking you? Because there are people in this building that have submitted to say, God, I want to go where you're taking me, and they are living in the fullness of their purpose right now. Wake my son up. Tyler, wake up. Wow. All right, I need to hurry up. Here's the power of experience. All right. Paul didn't want to just know God in this educational knowledge transfer way. He wanted experience. Here's the power of experience. Experience brings things to life. Experience will alter your belief, your understanding, and your behavior. Experience will alter your belief, your understanding, and your behavior. Um, a, a friend of ours that uh, lives in our neighborhood, they used to live in Indiana, and uh, in, what, they moved here in 2019, maybe, 2018, well, the year before that, um, the school that their son went to his freshman year was a school in Indiana, high school, where there was a mass shooting. He was in it, news footage, everything, right? So he got out and, well, when he came to school here, uh, you know, they do these drills of what to do if an intruder comes in, mass shooting, and, and so they're doing the drill at his new high school the next year, and he begins to have a panic attack. Other kids are laughing and joking as they're doing the drill, casually listening, going where they're supposed to go. Man, if this really happened, I would do this, I would do that, ha, 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 ha. And he's having a panic attack attack because of the experience of living through it. See, the ideology, the concept, the conceptualization for the other kids was just like, oh, you know, theoretically, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this. But he said, I could tell you what you'll do because I lived it. So what I feel while you laughing and joking is because of the experience that I've had. That has altered my belief, my understanding, and my behavior. The same way that Paul was saying, I want to know Christ so that my belief, my understanding, and my behavior are altered. Here's why that's important. Because days are coming. Where storms are coming. And if I have not experienced Christ, if I have not experienced being in that state of right relationship, I'm flailing, trying to grab at something to hold on for hope. 
But when I'm holding on to the experience, I know that even in this trial, there's victory. Because I've experienced it. It's a different level. Right. What they say, there's levels to this thing. It's a different level when you experience it. Come on. And so Paul said, I got to devalue some stuff because I need to experience this. Look, he didn't just say he wanted to experience God and, and all be well. He said he even wanted to experience him in his suffering because I know that I know when the times are tough, how did you get through it, God? Let's go. <laughs> we, 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 we want the theoretical side of it, right? I'm going to tell you something. If you take business and you want to go into business, don't take business classes from a teacher that's never owned a business. They can teach you theory. They can teach you theory. They can teach you economics. They could teach you how to balance a sheet. They can't tell you, man, when, when the red is there, how do I keep my business open? How do I get to the next day? How do I manage the emotions of that struggle? See, that only comes through experience. That comes through experience. When they were shutting everything off, when you had to hide like it was I almost made it. No. Okay. When you got to hide, like certain people knocking on your door, because you don't know how you're going to manage the next day. I need to talk to that dude that ran that business that made it through. I need to talk to that God that made it through. I need to be mentored by that man or woman of God that made it through. I need to have that pastor that made it through. Hey, I'm setting y'all up for success. Whether you chew on it or not is your, your decision. But I'm setting you up for success. I'm setting you up for success. Because everything is not going to go the way you think it's going to go. If we don't see the value in righteousness, we won't ever pursue it. One of the things stopping us from walking in proper relationship to God is our pursuit of who we think we should be, who we want to be, and sometimes who others want us to be. You got to understand that expectations come with definitions. Expectations come with definitions. So when people are putting expectations on you, there's definitions associated with that. So the importance of devaluing those voices and valuing walking in an experiential relationship with God, not just a knowledge base, and you know, we need knowledge. I am not downgrading knowledge. What I'm telling you, knowledge has to be experienced with God through faith because faith is how we grow. Right. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. I'm going to really uh, speed this up here. <clears throat> Not that I've already obtained all this or that I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. <laughs> But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to yet have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward that what is ahead. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Third point is this. Christ saves you with a purpose. 
Paul wanted to fulfill that purpose. See, the whole reason he had to devalue some things was because he realized God saved me for a reason. For those of you questioning, you can write this down again. I'll read it and you can look it up yourself. But Acts 9, 15 and 16, this was when Paul had been on the road to Damascus and uh, the Lord came to him, showed him the light and blinded him. And then he was talking to the guy that he wanted to go speak to him. And he said this, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God didn't blind Paul, knock him off that donkey just because. It was a cool story. That's not why he got Paul's attention. That's not why he got your attention either. That's not why he's trying to get your attention right now. That's not why he got your attention years ago when you came to know him. Attached with your conversion was a purpose, a plan. And Paul recognized that. And so he said, I want to press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. I want us to be in sync. I want to be in sync with why you saved me. I want to be in sync with the purpose that you have for me. I want to be in sync. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says this. For he chose us before him. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his will and his pleasure. God does nothing willy-nilly, as I like to say. He does nothing just by chance. He does nothing like, man, I accidentally said what I needed to say to draw you unto me. Like, that's crazy how that happened. Like, (laughs) everything he does, he does with a purpose. You being here on this earth, there's a reason. You being in the presence of my voice today, there is a reason, because there is this drawing that God is constantly doing to get his children on page so that we can be in the proper relationship with him so that we can walk out his purpose. Because salvation is for uh, to us, but what? But for somebody else. That's what this just said. God said, hey, I called him. I'm saving Paul so that he can reach some other people. Now, some of us are like, well, I'm not called to be a preacher. I'm not called to this, that, or the other. We're, we're, we're not talking about being in the five-fold ministry right now. We're not. But we are talking about purpose. And purpose, absent from relationship with God is confidence in the flesh. It's focus on the flesh. And you can have a measure of success in terms of financial gain and, you know, you may gain popularity. But success in walking out who God truly created you to be and impacting your circle of influence, you can't do that outside of God. You can't do that outside of God. See, Paul went from shaming a group of people to understanding the promise that was there for that group of people. We, and you can read it, I'll just tell you that the end of this is 
We get to be with Christ. Finish reading Ephesians. We get to be with Christ. That's what the end result of this, this righteous, righteous walk is, is we get to be with Christ. But I want you to close your eyes for a minute. And I want to ask you this question, two questions. The first is, do you believe Christ saved you for a purpose? For a purpose. Not just to be with you in heaven. He wants that. But do you believe he saved you for a purpose? I will tell you, that is something we have to take hold of. I believe people here are stuck in some ways in their relationship, in their growth, because that part of your salvation is blurred. The purpose part is blurred. So it's been hard to keep tracking and moving forward because you're like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know what the purpose is. But I will tell you, the state of being in proper relationship with God will open your eyes and your ears, will remove the blinders so that purpose can be revealed. When we start to stop focusing on what we aren't, who we aren't, or who we think we are, and allow God to speak the truth of who we are when we are found in Him, it elevates us to a different place of belief, power, focus. Lastly, I want to ask you, what are the things that you are valuing today that probably need to be devalued? What are the things in your life today that probably need to be in the rubbish pile in order for you to walk out this righteous life. And again, I'm, we're not talking about just sin, guys. We're not talking about just sinful things, you know. We're talking about just things that are taking us away from what Christ is trying to build in us. And I don't, I'm not asking you today to make these large, drastic changes. What I am asking you to do is allow God to speak to your heart and begin to make these incremental changes as God reveals things to you and just start walking out that faithfulness. And there's a maturation process that will happen. There's through that experience, you'll be ready for the next thing, the next phase, the next stage, because that's how life works. That's how life works. You're not born, go to kindergarten, and then go to college. You don't get a job and then just become the CEO. As an athlete, you don't go from peewee straight to the pros. There's a progression. And I think times we don't often, we, we discount the progression. Just, God, I just want to be what you want me to be. So I want you to ask God, God, what are those little things? Just, just give me one that I can start working with. Heavenly Father, 
I pray right now for your, your church, your body, Lord God. I just ask, God, that you would reveal to us, Lord God, those things that you desire us to do, Father God, to walk in closer, deeper relationship with you, Father. Lord God, may we not walk condemned, Father God, but may we walk with purpose, a purposeful, Lord God, an intentional journey with you, Father. Lord God, may our love for you begin to grow so that it's easier to devalue some of those things, Lord God, that may be in the way. God, we just, we, we need you, we want you. We desire to be who you are saying we should be, Father. May your glory be seen through our lives. May you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.